All right. So, um, hi everyone. Um, it's Austin Nakatsuka, uh, outgoing Cornea Fellow, and um, I just have a uh, presentation to share um, before we move on to Dr. Crandall's presentation. So I'm going to share my screen right here. Okay. Um, so uh, this presentation is called an update in the acute management of Steven Johnson syndrome. Um, and I'm going to talk about a modified surgical technique. So I realize that this is a topic that has been talked about before um, in the past. Uh, however, um, there are a few things that I kind of learned about uh, based on some papers and, and then trying them out myself uh, in terms of the surgical management of um, acute Stevens Johnson syndrome. So um, I'm going to show some pictures of that and some cases that I uh, at least attempted to do. Um, I got a lot of my uh, input from Dr. Lin, who's um, kind of our go-to for the for Stevens Johnson's here. I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures. So very briefly, Stevens Johnson syndrome, a uh, very severe dermatologic emergency characterized by bullous lesions of the mucosal tissues um, and skin tissues. It's T cell mediated, um, causing a apoptosis of skin uh, keratinocytes, um, usually drug incited, often sulfa-based drugs, although mycobacterium pneumonia has also been implicated and in other infectious causes. Um, it's a very severe disease, uh, mortality rate of up to 40%, um, uh, no matter what we do. Um, and in terms of the treatment goals, um, it's really just removing the uh, offending agent if it's identified uh, life support as well. Um, using high dose steroids is controversial in terms of whether or not it actually affects mortality, but it's very commonly done. Um, there's also some studies that have shown that IVIG and cyclospor systemic cyclosporin have had some benefits as well. Um, and then in terms of the ophthalmic sequela of SGS, these can be very, very severe, um, as many of us know and have dealt with. Um, in terms of the, the acute findings, uh, pretty severe conjunctivitis. Uh, uh, patients can present with pretty severe purulent conjunctivitis. Um, even conjunctival pseudomembranes, which we'll see an example of uh, shortly. And then um, persistent corneal defects or epithelial defects um, as well. Very rarely they can also present with uveitis, at least it's been described. In terms of the chronic downstream effects, this is where um, patients can really be severely affected. Um, so patients can have severe symblepharon, which can be irreversible, fornicil destruction requiring uh, fornicil reconstructions, limbal stem cell failure, which can basically cause irreversible scarring of the cornea um, and need for corneal transplants and severe corneal ulcerations, um, eyelid keratinization, recurrent trichiasis, and permanent dry eye can also occur basically due to destruction of the meibomian gland orifices, goblet cells, and lacrimal ducts. Um, so very, very severe disease. Uh, similar to severe burn patients and OCP patients as well. Um, it's interesting because uh, a lot of these patients, they may have some severe dermatologic uh, findings, but often they will complain about their eye symptoms the most, um, if they're able to, if they're not intubated, that is. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the scarring that can occur. Um, so here you can see uh, near total opacification and neovascularization of the cornea. Um, and this happens to be uh, caused by a patient in, as, uh, who had SJS, and this required a um, either a type 1 capro in the top right, or this is something called a type 2 capro, which involves um, the uh, eyelids as well um, for more severe cases of scarring. And so the medical management of ocular uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome basically involves topical steroids, cyclosporin, uh, and our antibiotics for prophylaxis, and basically very, very aggressive lubrication around the clock. Uh, we typically recommend preservative-free forms of drops uh, in all cases, just to help preserve the ocular surface as much as possible. Um, and then daily fornicil sweeps to remove pseudomembranes. This is something that was classically taught in the past. Um, it is uh, relatively 
controversial about whether or not this can actually help prevent um, uh, severe scarring, um, but uh, frequently residents will find themselves doing that as well. And so this is a table that was published in 2016 in ophthalmology. And basically what it kind of shows is a grading criteria that was uh, sort of made um, basically uh, separating mild, moderate, severe, and uh, very severe disease. And the main thing that's important here is it sort of helps to tell us um, when surgical intervention with amniotic membrane transplantation is um, indicated. And that's in the severe and very severe forms. Um, the other thing to note is that the uh, severe and very severe forms in this table um, are uh, separated by basically any sort of corneal staining or defect and or uh, more severe eyelid margin staining uh, or uh, involvement. And this is another grading table that was made as well. Um, but the uh, difference with this table is this uh, table basically um, separates the severe and very severe categories um, based on whether or not there's pseudomembranes present, uh, which was notably absent in the previous table. Um, but I found this to be quite helpful because truthfully, um, when you're examining these patients, it can be very difficult. Um, because uh, you know they're very sensitive, they're often in a lot of pain, um, and you're usually uh, examining them uh, at the bedside in, in the hospital. And so uh, you know you have limited exam um, instruments as well. And so one of the things that's kind of easiest to identify, which basically will tell you, hey, this is a severe disease, we need to do amniotic membrane transplantation, is whether or not there's pseudomembranes. And again, we'll show some uh, examples of that. Uh, so this is a nice little paper that was done at Loyola by Dr. Lin and authors. Um, but essentially, just really quickly, I just want to point out that they uh, looked at quite a number of eyes um, that uh, had SJS and um, were treated. And basically, they found that um, early intervention with amniotic membrane uh, resulted in a better outcome compared to those that were um, only medically managed. And so, um, so this talk is mainly going to focus on the surgical management of SJS. And so uh, just uh, quickly, I'm going to talk about the traditional technique that um, I was kind of first introduced to uh, when I got here and that we've been doing for um, the better part of the year and has been done uh, previously as well and is described in a couple of papers. But uh, this is basically how we have been doing it. Um, so basically, we take a sheet of amniotic membrane here, and, we, and typically we take a five by five centimeter sheet. And what we do is we cut that in half, and we use each half for each eyelid. So basically, you have a five by two and a half centimeter sheet of amniotic membrane that you're using for each eyelid. Um, here you can kind of see us um, uh, dealing with the amniotic membrane. And as uh, many of you know who have dealt with this before, it's very sticky material. Um, and can be sort of difficult to work with. And so uh, marking it with a marker is a very important step to kind of know where your boundaries are. Um, but essentially what we're doing is first we overlay this um, anterior to the lash line. We do remove the lashes beforehand. And then we typically secure it to the skin with um, running uh, sutures, um, usually nylon. And after that, uh, we are basically, after that has been secured, we basically secure the other end deep into the fornix with a um, proline suture, uh, which you can kind of see here and here as well. And so it can be a little bit difficult in terms of the view. We use a muscle hook to try to give us the best view possible. And we try to go as deep into the fornix as we can and pass that um, proline suture. And it's then secured with bolsters to the uh, upper to the eyelid skin. And basically that will effectually cover up the, um, <clears throat> the eyelid margin and meibomian glands with the uh, amniotic membrane and then as much of the uh, tarsal conjunctiva as possible as well. And so this is sort of what it looks like 
when we're uh, finished with it, we place a prokara at the very end, which is a amniotic membrane fused to a symblepharon ring. And so the limitations of this procedure, so this typically requires um, the OR. The reason being is because often, again, these patients are very sensitive, so they often need to be sedated. Um, we do need a controlled setting because we work with very small sutures that can be very difficult to work with at the bedside, um, especially if these patients are in an ICU setting, so they have a lot of lines and vents and things like that around the head of the bed, so it can be very, very difficult at bedside. Um, it can be fairly time consuming when you're doing each of the lids individually and relatively costly, especially if you're using the operating room. Um, one thing I also want to note is that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, sometimes we have to use general anesthesia for these patients um, because of their sensitivity. And the problem is that these patients, uh, when it comes to intubation, they have SJS, so their mucosal tissues are typically uh, macerated and so often dermatology will ask us, hey, please try to do anything possible not to intubate these patients, um, which unfortunately sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. Um, so I wanted to talk about a modified technique that I became aware of after reading some papers um, and that I became particularly interested in um, that may kind of help us a little bit uh, in terms of making this procedure a little bit more efficient in some ways. So basically this was a paper uh, out of Mass Eye in 2016, I believe. Um, and basically it describes a sutureless way to um, place these amniotic membranes um, with cyanoacrylate glue um, for acute Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And so essentially what is done and described here is taking a larger piece of amniotic membrane and it's basically a five by 10 piece and this is overlaid over anterior to the eyelids, just like we did previously, but it's glued with cyanoacrylate glue, typically the same ones that we use for corneal gluing actually. Um, and basically it is glued um, first to the upper and then to the lower. And then essentially that amniotic membrane, because it's so large, is able to be overlaid over all the fornices and the um, cornea and the entire eye itself. Um, and then after that, a uh, symblephron ring, which is made uh, is, is then placed over the amniotic membrane to hold it there. So first off, this is a picture describing, pictures describing how to make that some blepharon ring. This is just made with IV tubing, that butterfly tubing and cyanoacrylate glue. And then the, and this is just showing how it's placed. And so this was just a case series of four patients that they uh, described this technique in, but they had pretty good follow-up uh, over a year. Um, but it's just interesting. They all had actually relatively good visual acuity outcomes, um, but it's interesting to note that they all had irregular eyelid margins, eyelid margin keratinization, and conjunctival scarring, regardless of whether the procedure was done. And this is uh, common and true too in other studies as well. And this was another paper in 2015, another case series in 2015 describing um, a similar technique where basically they made their own some bluff run ring. Uh, they use sutures, um, but they tacked it down uh, instead of glue to enter to the um, lash line and then stuck in the uh, some bluff run ring. Um, notably though, they did state that temporal some bluff run did occur. Uh, so they did five patients in, with the traditional technique and then four patients with this technique. And they noted that uh, symblephron occurred in more patients um, that they did the traditional technique in than uh, with this technique. And, it's, uh, and they speculate that it's possible because the uh, amniotic membrane covers up more of the conjunctival tissues, which makes sense. Um, however, nearly all the patients did have some libomine gland um, dysfunction. Um, I so basically that series, although it's just a couple of patients, seem to kind of favor the large amniotic membrane um, technique, in, at least in terms of outcomes. So these are my attempts at, a, at some form of a modified technique. Um, so case one, so I had a 14-month-old uh, patient with SGS caused by Bactrim use for a leg abscess. And, um, and this was definitely the youngest patient that I've ever uh, 
seen with SJS and or done amniotic transplant, membrane transplant for. Um, I did look uh, in the literature and SJS has been reported in cases as young as three months old. Um, and there's even case, a case series describing uh, ophthalmic or ocular involvement uh, in cases as young as six months old, but none that really describe amniotic membrane transplant for a child this young, for sure. Um, so uh, I, I knew that I had to kind of modify it anyway because I wasn't sure that a regular Procara would fit in the patient's eye. So, uh, so this is what she looked like beforehand. And so this, um, this staining here, uh, so you can see the entire, what looks like the entire tarsal conjunctiva is staining, but then when it's uh, rubbed off with a cotton tip applicator, um, we see that it easily is removed without any bleeding. And so these are pseudomembranes. Um, and so uh, I quickly identified that this is some pretty severe disease and you can see the eyelid margin staining as well. And this, so basically um, I had to make a modified, some Lefron ring for her because the Procara would not fit. And so what I did is I just took IV tubing and I didn't really think to use glue. And basically I just used some of the proline, extra proline suture and I just tied it together. And as you can see, it kind of makes a teardrop shape here, which you think, oh, you know, wouldn't be, wouldn't fit as well in the patient's eye. Uh, however, um, because of the dimensions of the canthi and the eye, um, which are basically, you know, wider horizontally than vertically, it actually fit really well um, just behind both of her canthi. And so here you can kind of see that teardrop shape here. And uh, this is the section where kind of the knot was actually rotated through the IV tubing. And uh, she was actually very comfortable with it and she ended up leaving it in for uh, about uh, two and a half weeks before I removed it. Um, well, so this is what it looked like just after the procedure. I did do the uh, traditional technique with the running suture. And, and so this patient, um, this is after we removed the Simblephron ring and the uh, amniotic membrane. And she did have some tarsal conjunctival staining, I'm sorry, scarring, um, which uh, it was pretty much inevitable that she was gonna have some, but she did not have any Simblephron formation and here you can see the this is staining, but it's it's really kind of just pooling in the areas of scarring. But the eyelid margin, um, it's kind of hard to see her, was actually okay. And uh, I've been following her and she's actually been doing, seems to be doing okay. So she might actually do fine. Uh, case two, this is a nine-year-old with SGS caused by um, some sort of antibiotic. And so uh, I don't have any pictures for this, but that's probably best because uh, this didn't really work out so well. Um, but basically I used the glue technique um, but I don't have the five by 10, I did not have the five by 10 amniotic membrane. So we just used the five by five cut in half and I did it at the bedside and I glued it to his um, eyelids, but um, I didn't have anything to tack down the other end with. So it was kind of loose and hanging there. And he basically pulled it off within two nights or something like that. So uh, that didn't work out so well, but that patient actually did okay because he was actually very borderline moderate severe disease. Um, this was a 70 year old with SJS caused by Bactrim and uh, I did the glue technique with her, but uh, we did it um, in the OR. And uh, let's see, is this gonna play? Oh, so this just kind of depicts some of the pseudo membranes that were, that I found. Um, and essentially what I did was I glued it to the skin and then I placed um, a few interrupted sutures just to kind of hold it down because I wasn't sure the glue was going to hold. And I'm sorry, this has some of the ointment on it, so it looks sort of more uh, greasy looking than it really did right after the OR, but uh, it actually held very well. And this is post-op, I think this is post-op week one or two, and it was still holding. Oh, yeah. And so um, essentially she actually did fine with it and it held for at least a week and a half to maybe even two weeks before I eventually took it all down. And uh, she's been doing okay. Follow-up has not been great because of COVID lately. So haven't seen her more recently. Uh, she did have some symblephora, but that was already there even prior to the procedure. And then uh, lastly, case four, this is a 32 year old 
um, with SJS and she was on multiple medications. So we're not sure which one caused it. But anyway, um, I also did the glue technique with interrupted sutures on her. I also did her case in the OR and she had to be uh, under general anesthesia because she was very, very, very sensitive. Um, and she was, as you can see, she's pretty severe case. And again, I'm sorry, I put the ointment on before, but um, you can see here that the glue uh, actually dries down pretty well. I did have the interrupted there, but um, essentially she had some scar and Escher, so I really wanted to make sure that that was holding on. But there's one area here where it was a little more normal eyelid skin. And, and even after we put it on, I was thinking we really don't need the sutures because it actually held really well, we could tell in the OR. And uh, she's been doing okay with it. I think recently it just started coming off. So I, I just removed it actually yesterday. Um, she may need an additional grafting as well because of her disease. Um, so essentially the only thing that's been holding me back from doing the full five by 10 technique is truly the cost. Um, the, after looking into it, the five by 10 pieces of amniotic membrane cost twice, over twice as much as the five by fives do. Um, it does save you uh, the use of a Procara. Um, so basically, if you look at all four eyelids doing the calculations, the cost of the traditional technique is about five, a little more than $5,000. Um, and then the modified technique would be about $10,000 for two five by 10 pieces uh, because those sheets are so expensive. That doesn't include the cost of the glue, sutures, or IV tubing, but I've kind of looked into some of that and that's negligible. But um, by doing the modified technique, you maybe can avoid going to the OR. And of course, we know the OR costs a lot of money. So that was initially why I was actually interested in the, the technique was I was hoping it would save a lot of money, but I didn't realize the amniotic membrane was going to be so expensive. So anyway, in terms of the main points, we all know SGS is a devastating uh, disease that affects uh, ocular tissues um, and can be devastating despite any sort of intervention. Um, but early intervention with amniotic membrane should be considered with any SGS patient with moderate to severe uh, ocular involvement um, because it improves outcomes. And the advantages of a modified glue technique could include perhaps time inefficiency, if it's truly that quick to be doing at the bedside, a customizable procedure because um, you can create that blephron ring as big or small as you want it to be. Um, avoidance of the OR, as we know, is very important. Possible improved outcomes, although this doesn't, hasn't been uh, completely proven. And then possible costs, depending on what the OR uh, costs are. And these are my references. And that's it. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Any questions? Austin, thank you so much. This is Jeff Petty. I just wanted to uh, say thank you for the presentation. Uh, it, one of the questions that, that I had is, uh, how, how would you design a study if you were going to, you know, kind of take this uh, and, and try and, uh, you know, try and really assess whether this, this would be something that would work long term? And then the second question is, how frequently could could you anticipate avoiding the operating room uh, beyond the financial cost? There are a lot of benefits for keeping these patients out of the OR, uh, not, uh, you know, not, not even just the intubation, but other potential benefits. Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. And it's funny because it was something Dr. Lynn and I were just talking about last night. Um, first off, I think in terms of designing a study, you need volume of patients, right? And um, Initially, the number of SGS cases that we were having was not quite that high, but this past year, between Maddie and I, we've had almost 10 cases that we've done amniotic membrane floor. So if I can combine that with, I happen to be staying next year, then I think we'll have enough patients for more than just a series. Um, but uh, the other thing is, so, so I would probably look at outcomes like visual acuity, um, and then most of it would probably be descriptive in terms of um, eyelid margin, how the eyelid margin looks. Um, it's hard. The other thing in terms of follow-up, at least for patients here, is it's been difficult because a lot of these patients are um, from out of town or out of state. So it's a little bit hard for me to kind of track these patients. So um, it would be difficult in this setting to do anything more than a 
case series. But um, if I was say able and had the time to, you know, write up a protocol or anything like that, then I'd um, just, I'd probably compare retrospectively to the cases that we've done before. And then going forward prospectively, try to do this technique on um, a number of patients. Uh, the other thing, and then your other question, oh, in terms of uh, saving OR time and things like that. I think first I would have to see how successful this would, I haven't had a successful case at the bedside yet, but um, just by kind of trying out this technique, even in the OR with the glue, um, now I kind of know, and I'm pretty confident that, hey, this holds pretty well for the most part in most normal skin. So I'm a little bit more confident about trying it out at the bedside. So once I can kind of try one case out at the bedside and see, you know, how that goes, most of it is just whether or not it's going to hold or uh, it's going to kind of stick there, then I would be confident with trying more additional cases. I think, I think one thing that we could try is, you know, if you're, you're still taking patients to the OR, you could try doing the glue technique in the OR. Without, without any of the interrupted sutures. Because I know you had put some interrupted sutures in the last couple of cases. Oh, yeah. Maybe trying it without, see if it holds. And if those hold, maybe we could, you know, go to the bedside fully. Sure. Anything else? OK. Uh, let's see. So. I have, uh, let's see, I don't wanna stop share here. Okay, uh, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Alan Crandall, who needs no further introduction as we all know him. Um, and I will get to know him, I'm sure a lot more next year. Um, but he is gonna be presenting two uh, video cases um, or two videos, uh, one of which is his presentation that recently won the award at Ascaris, uh, which was sort of held online this year, but uh, it was an award for his video um, on the dye matrix, and so I'll show you that. And then the other is on some ACO cataract uh, efficiency type of settings. So we're going to switch over to him. All right. There you go. Okay. Am I, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Good. So I, I got to pull up the video. So everyone can see your screen. You just pick. There it is. Okay. Perfect. So I really, really two two quick presentations. Uh, this is a new. Uh, 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 essentially, it's a replacement in a pupil enlarger, and it has some advantages to it. You'll recognize it isn't. I, I did the surgeries, obviously, but Liliana did all the work, and Nick did all the beautiful talking. So we'll just let that run. Should go. It's not running. Okay. The Expand, manufactured by Diametrix, is a nitinol pupil expander with a 6.7 millimeter internal aperture created from a laser welded wire. It is a smooth and flexible ring with eight points of contact with the iris, which has recently been developed to deal with small pupils intraoperatively. Dr. Charles Williamson from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, has recently proposed the use of this device for a technique called iridocapsular capture. This could be useful in many situations, such as in cases with missing or weak zonules, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, pseudoexfoliation, among others. This could be particularly useful in pseudoexfoliation as patients are at higher risk of intraoperative issues related to zonular weakness and poor pupillary dilation. Studies showed that the CCC can withstand loads of approximately 0.4 newtons before tearing. As the X-band is smooth, thin, and flexible with low compression forces, it should not carry a significant risk to the rexus edge. The X-band was initially evaluated with four cadaver eyes prepared as per the Miyake apple technique. 
it is easy to place the four feet of the expand that cradle and expand the iris. From an anterior view with retroillumination, after capsulorexis was performed, two feet of the device were manipulated to capture the capsulorexis edge in two opposite areas, which was enough to stabilize the bag and zonules during the subsequent procedures. <laughs> Note how strong the capsulorexis edge is, and no tears could be produced in the points of contact with the expand. Evaluation of the entire surgery from the posterior view shows the stability of the capsular bag zonular complex during all of the steps of the thick emulsification procedure and up to the IOL implantation. <laughs> also evaluated the applicability of this device during IOL explantation by using a pseudophagic cadaver eye implanted with a single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens. Note that the anterior capsule of the eye shows signs of fibrosis and there's a mild amount of summering's ring formation within the capsular bag. The expand was placed in a way to fully expand the pupil and also to capture the capsulorexis edge over two opposite areas. This stabilized the capsular bags on your complex during such steps as visco dissection of the capsulorexis edge, irrigation aspiration of submarine green material, as well as mobilization of the haptics of the IOL out of the equatorial region. <laughs> We have been using the preloaded expand in surgical cases at the Moran Eye Center. This is a case of an 80 year old man with pseudoxfoliation exhibiting weak zonules. The device was used for irritable capsular caption. Stability of the capsular bag was obtained, allowing for pre chopping, fake emulsification, and bimanual irrigation aspiration. <laughs> After complete evacuation of the capsular bag, the captured edges of the pupil and the capsular rexus by the four feet and shoulders of the device can be well appreciated. A CTR was implanted, followed by in the bag IOL fixation. The X band was disengaged with a hook and placed in front of the iris, then engaged by the injector for removal from the eye. This is a case of a 58-year-old man with a severe degree of zonular instability. Surgery in the contralateral eye of this patient had required use of multiple iris and capsular hooks. The expand was used in this case, especially for capsular capture. As some instability of the bag was still observed, iris hooks were used to secure the expand in place. Subsequent surgical steps could be performed without any issues. There was significantly more stability in this case and less phaco time in comparison with the contralateral eye. After insertion of a CTR and in the bag eye well fixation, the device was manually removed with a forceps through the main incision. In summary, owing to its design and material characteristics, the use of this new pupil expander to perform irritable capsular capture is a promising technique in cases with zonular instability.
how do I get rid of this? Go up here. Now, uh, <clears throat> I know we've, we've had, we had this available at the, uh, at the Moran, of course, and uh, at the Institute as well, but um, most of the use I get here. So uh, any, any uh, questions that anybody has, it's pretty easy to see. I'm trying to work with them to get a little bit better um, injector and removal, because sometimes that's, that's a bit of a, of a, of a drag, but um, it's, it's actually been quite helpful in many cases. Uh, just like anything though, there is technique and there's technique involved. So what I would recommend is using it on cases where you just want pupil dilation to start with and then try to figure out uh, size of rexus that you can do it in. Uh, in the Miyake views, we use very small rexus. That's why we only use two, um, uh, used it in two spots, but because it, it, it gets, it, the smaller the rexus, the, the harder it is to get the two side ones in. Um, any questions on that? Hey, Alan, uh, quick, two quick questions. So one of the challenges with the night null ring is in the removal, it tends to fold on itself. If you could just comment on that for anyone using it. And then second, I, I, I like this technique, but one of the things I worry about is as you know, we know when you remove a Malugan ring, you displace the iris significantly. And as we've captured the the capsule bag as well, as we're removing this ring, even though it is night and all, it's flexible, it does, you know, iatrogenically potentially cause more damage to the zonules. So can you comment on how that might be removed without uh, causing more damage to weak zonules? Well, in, in all these, in most of these cases, uh, I'm not, obviously not trying to get the, the, um, uh, below the iris in, into the capsular bag. So most of the time it's really not, not much of an is issue. It's so flexible. I mean, there, there, you, could, you can use a, a second instrument to hold the, the opposite sides and then bring them out and up. Uh, you can, there are a couple of different ways to do that. And I'm working on a video so that we have uh, uh, different ways for different, um, um, different types of eyes. And also uh, sometimes you will get it, it doesn't work for everything. And we had one case where it didn't work and I had to take it out. Uh, and, and actually this was a very, even wasn't as loose as the guy that we got it in, uh, but, uh, and then we had to do, do an extra cap. So, you know, just like everything, there's always, there's always a learning phase, but this is actually one of the easier ones. The nice thing is, is that it's, from a standpoint of a surgeon, it, it doesn't, you know, the, the thing with the Malugan, which is, uh, I love Boris's procedure, but it, it has more volume to it. And it sometimes, as you know, is hard to, uh, to get other devices in. You can, you can do it, but this, this, even if you decided you didn't want to use it in the back and you preferred to use uh, other, you know, like MST hooks or whatever hook, uh, McCool hooks, you still could do that uh, comfortably. So you can you can make sure that it's above <coughs> the rexus easy, easily. Just it's just visualization, and and it you can counter traction <coughs> counter put some counter forces on it. So when you when you remove one of the sides, you don't dis dislocate the lens itself. Like in that gentleman that I had, I kept those those um, uh, those extra uh, iris hooks to hold them, so that there was no way it could be could drop uh, once I popped the bag. Thank you, Alan. We don't see any other questions that have come up on the chat. If anyone would like to make additional questions, please post them there. We can unmute you uh, and you can move on to your next video. Okay. Uh, this is an, an ongoing um, technique and I do want to, st let me start with all this crap. How do you get rid of this one too? Yeah. Yep. Okay, now I want to get rid of this. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, and everybody in, in this audience should know a little bit about that because I'm going to put up my references to start with, uh, and it, because I'm I'm not sure how many uh, folks understand how much work is done in our laboratory here downstairs, and this is almost always done with the residents. Uh, Randy has spearheaded this for I'd have to say 20 years. So these are the references that we that I think everybody in this center should have read prior to starting 
of some FACO at least during this, the third and fourth year that they're working on it. Because these things are, they are, it's a laboratory study, but it's very, they're very, very informative. And uh, you're in this a lot. Um, so I think you wanna, you know, it, it, I just would recommend everybody take a look at all these references. Uh, they're easy to get to. Uh, we have them all over the place. So we'll start that way. Now, let me open up my talk. Let's get up to where we started. And I, I'll, I'll cut out a quick, a few things because I know we have, uh, everybody has to get to work. So <laughs> I'm, for the last about two years, uh, or yeah, about two years, I've been doing what, is, what I'm calling a FACO efficiency study. It's a combined study with myself in, in uh, Utah, obviously, Taka Akahoshi <clears throat> in Japan, and we have some, uh, some of our uh, international folks that have also been working a little bit on this. Uh, unfortunately for me, there are no conflicts during this talk, so let's just play it up. Where is it? Where's the full screen? Come on. Can we do that? Okay. So, <clears throat> what is fake efficiency? You can define it in any way you want, but basically, what we're measuring is just looking at every maneuver during the entire procedure, try to analyze each step to look for ways to improve, introduce technique alterations, instruments, machine parameters, changes that we can improve our outcomes. Uh, it, uh, you know, if you look at the United States, for example, the, I, I think last year the average vi visual acuity for most cases was 2050, you know, maybe black, uh, you know, blaring down to 2200 but there are rocks and they're all different and it's important to really understand that so you really need to get to the point where you look at an eye you realize that it's it's slightly different from the one you just did and you look need to look at your parameters your instruments and need to really understand what you're doing now a good example of that is this when we when we first started doing FACO 40 years ago for me, somewhere in that range, we were doing radial aspirations and we taught radial aspirations. And then when you look at what just happened to the zonules, when you're radially aspirating, as opposed to when you do a uh, tangential, uh, so we're now teaching tangential. But how do we know, when, when did we find all this stuff out? Well, it was laboratory work done right here uh, with uh, Liliana and Takashi and uh, Brazil, I showed beautiful videos of showing that. So just a quick, uh, let's go to the next. So, uh, where's the, all right, my, it's not responding. Let's, okay, here we go. So, uh, so I, uh, from a technique standpoint, what, what we wanna do is not strip to the center, we strip radially as much as we can, and the one thing I, I found is that it's significantly more, uh, uh, it's way more uh, useful and quick. And, and, and the, uh, also, the, uh, I used to teach grabbing to do your rexus. Now I do uh, almost always in two or three maneuvers uh, and just pulling to the center rather than that. And again, there you're looking at the vector forces. So you can uh, analyze where your rexus. I have much more control doing that. And the risk of tearing out is much less because you have total control. And you're essentially doing 360 uh, little maneuvers so that you have absolutely good control. And then we'll just do one more uh, just to see the radial, I mean the uh, tangential aspiration. It's way more efficient. And uh, we're, ha we're working on some, uh, equipment that might make it even a, a, a lot simpler. So we'll just go see it. I know everybody's seen this, but it's always good to really look and realize what you're doing. Now the last piece you can do that radially because there's no, there's nothing holding it on. So everything that we do, except for in really in, in peds and in super soft cataracts is a divide and conquer. The classic divide and conquer, which, which, which we start with, is of course a sculpting procedure. And during a sculpting procedure, we, we, we wanna use, uh, as you know, 
we want to use lots of power and no occlusion and we have different tips that we can use as well i mean you could actually have a two hand pieces one with a sculpting tip and one with a, a more effective uh, vacuum tip but we don't do that there's vertical chopping and horizontal chopping but all of these again are really divide and conquer techniques the issue is how do you divide it into into pieces classic ways of the sculpt uh, vertical chopping horizontal chopping are both important pre-chopping is what i use most of the time but but if we're limited because the choppers are the pre-choppers are are in, uh, instruments and they have different thicknesses and so we've worked out with the companies we now have very thin ones to help when you do a femto laser and kind of break it up and we have for this study we have two new very sharp uh things they look they look sort of dangerous when you look at them from the side but if you realize where you're putting them you can easily see right here one crack through this is a very sharp one and of course we have the my loop and there are some other variations on on uh divide and conquer techniques so it, just for the first and second year residents, when you look at the per variable parameters every single time, so, and this, this we go through every year, I ask the new fellows uh, what their IOP aspiration flow, side, flow, aspiration flow and ultrasound are, and it's almost 100% say, well, it's just whatever is first thing on the machine. And I think you really have to understand what you're what you're telling the FACO tip aspiration tip to do. And if you just look at these three things, there are 20 different, 27 different combinations that you can do. If you want the IOP down low, you don't want the ultrasound. You may want the ultrasound power. You can leave that wherever you want, but you don't want you don't want high flow uh, with a low IP. So you have to you have to look at the look at the nucleus. And figure okay in this case or if it's destable like in a, a P, pxc you might you want the asp you want the iop at a certain range but you need to then change your aspiration flow and probably change your ultrasound power and the other thing that we have is we have different instruments we can we're looking at new instruments combos so that we can decrease the amount of of handing back and forth we have i have a new uh piece that has a marker plus the Rex, so you get, you just put a Rex on, turn it around, you don't have to get a new instrument and you can do your Rexes. The new Akahoshi hydro dissector is, I think, far superior to uh, the Kalman. The flow is really much easier to control and we have some new Akahoshis and Akahoshi cradle uh, uh, pre-choppers. So the, the thing is to evaluate settings to improve the outcomes in different levels of hardness. And we also have to remember we have lots of tip designs. Uh, here's here are some of the newer instruments. You can see down here in the corner how sharp the tip of this one looks. It's hard to see on this small ring, but it, 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 if you if you look at it, it's about the size of a FACO tip. So we scare ourselves a little bit when we when we use instruments we're not used to. They can look dangerous because we're going into the nucleus. And they can be dangerous if you don't know where where you are or what you're doing but they're very very effective these these have different parts this part up here is sharp this and the, and the this of course the flat part is not and one we have one with a very sharp tip to go in easily and then it's one with a slightly duller tip and we and also the ball ina uh excuse me uh makes it easy to rotate especially sub incisional uh, and but it's but it's a different angle, so you have to get used to putting these in and bringing these out. But but it's a very effective way of of doing this. Uh, the other thing we need is we if you look at power modulations, you have continuous, we have torsional, we have pulse, we have on and off with different powers. You know, if you hear the dinging and you're just using the standard stuff, what does that mean? I mean you're kicking it a little. Uh, longitudinal to free up the nucleus because you don't want it occluded. And that usually, we set it at 85%. So when it's 85% occluded, it'll start dinging. And that's telling you, okay, don't stop necessarily, but understand what's going on so you can change the power or reduce the amount of, of tissue that you're, that you're dealing with. 
or change your mode. You might want continuous, not torsional, because that way you can bury it. You might want pulse, which means you're telling the instrument, I don't want to be occluded at any point in time. So understanding all of those is really important. And then the, the, the next thing we have is uh, with tip design. You have straight, you have bent, you have reverse Kelmans, and you have INA materials and tips all over the place. So there's a lot of things that go into understanding this thing. I, I'm just gonna do a quick video. Well, maybe not. So run. And what, what I'm gonna show is what, what basically what we're doing um, at, in this procedure, measuring the, the pup, the, uh, I wanna make sure your wound is correct. So we're measuring. There's the Akahoshi pre-chopper, and <clears throat> it just really has a nice flow pattern to it. Uh, and I, so it's really nice to use. And you'll, this is the really sharp one. You see how I'm just demonstrating that for the pre-chop. And uh, it's just a slow motion, and you get a very nice uh, chop. You can rotate. And then Get your second chop. Where I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to speed this up. And then we'll go to the FACO. And you can start on any pattern you want. You want it off, you want it on, but you have to understand what each of these do. This is a reverse Kelman. Um, one of the studies from our laboratory said the 0.9 tip is the most efficient, and a 0.9 reverse Kelman uh, in my hands is the easiest to use for most of these cases. And then we finish the case, we finish that part. Now, the other thing about having the overlay, which is nice, is we can measure how much um, we use at each of these different steps. Let's see if I can find it. And there we go. So for, for the FACO port, we used 27 cc's. Now, we, to power this efficiently, we need, I need about 2,000 cases probably to really tell because there's so many different uh, eyes and we're a little more than two, one third to one half done. So then you proceed to the, you go to the INA and this is the ball. It's a very nice, uh, it's, a, it's different. So every time you try something different, you have to play with it a little bit. And this is the first time I used it. So you can see a little bit of how it works. You can, you can curve it, you can twist, move, but it is, it is a slightly different maneuver and you can polish with it. It's, it's a, they're coming out with a silicone one pretty soon for people that don't like the, this capability. Um, and then we'll just move to the end here and polish, et cetera, et cetera. So we uh, now at the end of the INA, uh, the end of this case, I think we had used six, uh, 29 cc or 31 cc's of fluid. Another one, and I don't, we don't need to show that. But so each time, then we took it to Tanzania where we, where we were doing much harder cataracts and trying to see is it is is FACO usable in these hard cases. Now this is a 1.9 reverse Kelman uh, Akahoshi tip, and it's pretty efficient. That that was a cataract that might have uh, before done uh, with an extra with the SICS. Um, so what, it, what, it, what, we, what we're looking at is uh, the usability is, you know, since one of the things we want to do is teach FACO but safely, uh, having pre-choppers and things like that gets rid of the uh, sculpting maneuver. And that's where most people uh, get into trouble. And then we can reverse, in other words, once they get used to that, then we can teach them how to do that. So we look at what happened. Uh, we increased the FACO compared to SICS for the first two trips by 15%, but it facilitated skills transfer. So we could have them pre-chop and then, uh, then they were a little bit easier to understand the depth. And once they got used to the FACO hand piece, it really facilitates that. In the US, what I've noticed is about a reduced FACO time by uh, about 20%, reduced INA by 25 and reduce the number of cases. Residents went from an uh, average of 120 to 80. We're still working on that. And of course, it depends on the time that they said August, a little bit more versus uh, the end of the year type of stuff. So we're looking, trying to look at that as well. 
so I, I know we don't have a lot of time to look at videos. I'm happy to do that at any time, but I, I do want to use my daily mantra of it's all about physics. Everything we do, you have to understand the physics of it. And it, it, I, I really suggest that everybody get those articles, understand what the, what the different machines will do and so that you, that you can really think about how hard is your cataract, which of the procedures should I do in this case? What's the safest way to get done and the most efficient way? So with that, well, it's not bad. Probably no time for questions, but I'd be happy to talk to anybody uh, on that. Jeff, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Alan. We are, uh, looks like there are no questions. Uh, and yeah, it's all about oh, the physics. None? Nobody's gonna give me any crap? Uh, I think everyone would love to give you crap, Alan. Uh, they'll just have to do that uh, after. after face to face. Okay. So with that, thank you everyone uh, for coming, Alan. Sincere thank you for your time and uh, Austin as well. Um, ex extraordinary uh, presentations and videos. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.